Hi there, and welcome to Kensington. We're so glad you're here with us today. If we haven't met yet, I'm Adam Karshner, lead pastor at the Clinton Township campus. I've only been on staff for a few months, so let me introduce myself. I've been married to my wife, April, for 10 years. We have five children that age and range three to eight, and I've been a pastor for about three years. We used to have some hobbies before all those kids, but now if we get a date night out eating new food, it's a pretty great evening for us. And I'm really grateful and excited to be part of the Kensington community. Before we continue with the final week of our series, on Moses, A Journey to Remember, I want to let you know about a couple of things happening soon. First, we have a free faith and family online event for parents of elementary students. It's called Big Feelings, and we'll be hearing from experts about helping our elementary students through anxiety and fear. As parents, we've already worried about how the upheaval of school rhythms and isolation has been affecting our kids, and now we've added the stress and fear of processing the communal trauma of Oxford. Childhood experts have shared how tragedies like this have been a source of isolation for local elementary kids. They hear their parents whispering and talking about safety, and then they hear confusing half-truths from their classmates. So how do we create a sense of normalcy and safety for our young children? while also inviting them to share their own feelings and fears. We'd like to invite you to join us January 27th at 8.30 p.m. for a virtual event on Facebook, or you can go to kensingtonchurch.org slash faith and family. As clinical therapists and Kensington attenders, Supriya C., Emily Skinner, and Brian Holt, a longtime therapist from Oxford, share how we can support our elementary age children. This is also a great event to invite your friends and neighbor to who are struggling with these things as well. Second is our new series, The Power of a Story. What do you think of when you hear the phrase, once upon a time? Maybe it's the tortoise and the hare, or the boy who cried wolf, or my personal favorite, the princess bride. But do you know who was one of the best storytellers? It was Jesus himself. The stories that Jesus told were known as parables, and they make up about 30% of his teachings. One of the reasons Jesus told so many stories is that they are more interesting. This is why at bedtime, children don't ask their parents, mom, dad, would you please sit down and share some facts with me? No, they ask mom and dad, would you tell me a story? However, the reason Jesus told parables wasn't to entertain his audience, but rather it was to teach and to provoke thought and to help people see things in a new way. We'd like you to join us January 30th as we look at what it means to build your life on a strong foundation, the power of forgiveness, the meaning of prayer, and what is truly valuable to God. It's gonna be an amazing time together as we experience the power of the story. Now let's go ahead and return to our service. We're excited to wrap up this series and learn more from long ago, the journey of the Israelites to the promised land and what it can teach us about ourselves today and who God is. Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to Kensington. My name is Jenny, this is my husband, Justin, and we are- I'm your plus one. Your Today you are. Yes, yes I today am. You are my yes, plus I am. One. Uh, but good morning. We're thrilled to have you here with us today. I want to uh, extend a special welcome to those of you joining us virtually. Thanks for tuning in. And to anyone who might be visiting or a guest today, uh, we're just thankful and glad that you braved the weather and the snowy roads and made it here uh, to worship and gather with us this morning. Uh, we have a great morning planned. If you are interested in getting connected, uh, ask have, if you have questions about Kensington or what's going on here, we want to invite you to stop by the alcove in the lobby area after the service today. There's a sign there that says, meet familiar faces. And that's just what we'd like to do. Justin and I will be there, a few others from our team, and we'd love just to meet you, uh, to hear a little bit of your story and how you wound up here and answer any questions if we can so yeah how many of you okay before I share about some opportunities that are happening around the community uh, how many of you are the type of person of when it snows you have to shovel right away like you're the first snow and then you're willing to do it three times because you're committed to keeping then how many of you are willing to just drive over that snow and deal with the ice later you're my people mm -hmm. you are my mm -hmm. people that's right <laughs> left this morning I'm like I'll deal with it later. I'll throw extra salt down. Anyways, that has nothing to do with today. Um, but hey, uh, one of the things I do want to let you know about, there are a couple different ways to get connected and have uh, opportunities to serve in our community, and we love sharing those. One of those right now, we host a warming center for the homeless alongside of other churches in this region. It's been a longstanding tradition, not only for Kensington, but for the entire region. And so uh, there are some ways to, to drop off some donations, gather donations, and be able to support that community. As you walk out outside, there's a table. You can grab some of those donations and bring uh, those cards back uh, with some donations next week, and we'd love to be able to gift that to uh, the warming center and be able to host this over the next couple weeks. 
The second thing that I want to let you know about for those of you who uh, realize this is like the first major snow that we've had in a while. And if you're like me, I love sledding. Like it's one of my favorite things to do with my kids. And so next week, we actually as a community are inviting you to join us at Beverly Park. We're going to go sledding and have some fun as families and community. Um, I'd love to see Steve, you out there get going down that, <laughs> that hill, hit the, bump, the jump, right? You and me, we'll do that together. Uh, but I just would love to see our community community having fun together and being a part of that and so we wanted to invite you out to be a part of that next week. Awesome. The other thing we want to let you know about is that January is just a perfect time to take a next step. So you've heard us mention a few already, but the one that I would really put at the forefront of, of your radar is group life. And I know for Justin and I, we talk very frequently about how our small group experiences, ranging from when we were teenagers until now, these are some of the most formative uh, experiences for our faith journeys as we think about the people that we have gotten to share life with. And even today, our small group continues to be the space where we experience great joy out of meaningful relationship and walking and growing together in faith. And so if you've maybe been on the fence thinking about group life, there are in-person and virtual options uh, both available right now. And they range from men's groups, women's groups, couples groups. Um, there's a married, uh, what's it? The marriage course, sorry, I said it wrong. The marriage yeah. course, which is an online option. Um, we're hosting Be the Bridge, which is a God's heart for racial reconciliation, his heart for humanity. That one's being hosted right now. Not to mention a lot of care workshops. And I think I can speak for all of us in saying we're still kind of coming out of this season where uh, we've experienced a little bit of stress and anxiety together, but there's grief recovery, divorce recovery, blended family workshops, so many incredible options to step into. And so I just, I plant those seeds for you because group life has been so instrumental in our own faith journeys and we'd love to invite you all to consider jumping in. And that that's way. why you'll see some of those out in the lobby to connect about mm -hmm. that as well. So uh, today we have a, a really special treat. Uh, one of my favorite uh, people and teachers, Dr. Eric Moore is here uh, from Trio Life. Yeah. Can you give him a big round of applause? Thank you. He loves the limelight, right? As my, that's, that's what you hope I do right now. Uh, but one of the cool things that I've enjoyed in our, in our church's partnership is we've been dreaming of ways to work together. And one of those ways actually uh, that our churches have come together is through our Afghani refugee uh, partnership and an um, and opportunity to serve as uh, some of the refugees that have been coming into this region. We work with an organization called Samaritas to partner for six months to help them be established. And our churches uh, have been partnered in this together to serve together and uh, this week was the first week that one of those families that we get to serve actually uh, our team got to meet together and be able to experience how do we move forward in serving uh, this this community as they're navigating such a difficult difficult season and so it's just been amazing and that's why I love having Dr. Moore here because he is such a partner with us and uh, he's going to bring the message today so I hope you lean in for that before we jump into that though why don't you stand up say hello to somebody around around you and let them know if you prefer snowboarding or skiing or none of it. No winter sports. actually love for you guys to stand back up and sing these next couple songs with us. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray. 
You know, uh, one of the things uh, about that song is it's such a reminder of what God does in our hearts. He stirs our hearts. And one of the reasons why we've been on this journey, the journey to remember, is it's the reminder of God's faithfulness and his promise and the way he has been present with us. And I was just talking about this with Eric just a second ago. It's like, it is the reminder in this season, every season, how much we need hope, how much, how desperate we are for hope. And as a community, when we sing, when we sing out these words, sometimes we sing because we fully believe them. We're like, I'm all in. But then sometimes it's a prayer of desperation. It's God, will you help me feel this? Will you remind me of this truth? Will you point me to you in a way that I can feel you that way? that I can hear you, that I can experience you. So this next song we're gonna sing together is a song called Egypt. And it is the story that we have been on, the story of God's faithfulness in the past that points us to not only his promise in the future, but his presence today. That God is with us, meeting us, walking with us, offering us hope even in the difficult moments. So when we sing this song, not only are we singing a song that that mirrors the story of the Israelites being uh, out of captivity into the promised land, but also our own hearts, where we have been held captive, where we have been held hurting, and God has moved with us, walked with us, and led us forward. So when we sing, we sing out of prayer, we sing out of praise, we sing out of desperation.
turned it off. Yeah, I, I don't know about you guys, but uh, you know, from in, in my tradition, we would be singing that song about four or five more times. You know, because it get gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder. And, uh, you know, you get to the point where you just can't contain yourself because of how good and how awesome God is. We sing hallelujah, hallelujah, because of what he has done for us. And I am uh, honored to be here today. And, you know, when I hear a song like that, it just reminds me uh, that God has brought Kensington a mighty long way. Uh, I've had an opportunity to have a relationship with uh, Kensington for over 20-something years, and I've had the opportunity to see what God has, has done throughout the years. And I think this series is appropriate, uh, that God takes Moses out of Egypt, uh, and he's taken him somewhere, and he's done the same thing for Kensington Church, and he's done the same thing for many of you as individuals. So I hope today as we look at the text that it would uh, speak to you as we come to this last segment of the series of coming out of Egypt. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 18, and we're going to pick it up uh, in the wilderness. Uh, God has taken uh, Moses and the Israelites out of Egypt, and so God has done some, some great work uh, in the life of the Jews and also in the life of Moses. And so Moses uh, has decided that he is going to send his wife and his two boys uh, back to live with his father-in-law just for a little bit because Moses uh, has a lot of things, a lot of ministry to do. And after a period of time, uh, Jephro, Moses' father-in-law, decides that uh, we need to to bring uh, your wife and uh, these kids back. I don't know if they was getting on Jethro's last nerve or what it was, but he decides that he is going to bring them back and reunite them with Moses. And so Moses has the opportunity to see him coming from a distance. And so that's where we're going to pick up the story right here. Exodus chapter 18, starting in verse 7. It says, so Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, praise be to the Lord who has rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who has rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. For he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. And so Jephro comes back, he brings the kids, he brings his wife, and they meet one another. They have a little powwow in the tent, and, and Moses is more than happy to, to tell Jethro all the things that the Lord had done because Jethro was not familiar with it. And as he hears him, he is, he is, he is overwhelmed by the goodness of the Lord in Moses' life. God had done a number of things in Egypt, and we can recall those things of bringing them out of Egypt and making the people uh, disposed to give them all of the things that they needed for their journey, and, and, and Moses just telling them the, him the goodness of the Lord. You know, one thing I, I, I see here is that they are still on a journey. They, they, Moses and the Israelites, are still on a journey. Uh, they have not made it to the promised land yet, but they're, they're, they're in transition. But in the midst of the transition, there is a pause to recall and reflect and give praise for what God has done in the past. Uh, God is going to do something significant in the future, and we're trusting him for that. But we stop and we pause and we reflect on what God has all 
already done. I was talking to Justin, and I says, you know, I know that Kenzie's doing some, some great things, but I was reflecting as somebody who is uh, outside looking in and knowing something about this great church of some of the things that the Lord has done and allowed Kenzie to do over the years. I just want to share some of the things that I know about. God has used Kensington to help stop human trafficking in Nepal. God has helped Kensington to help build a hospital in India. God has used Kensington to plant and partner with over 80 churches, and our churches being one that you've partnered with. God has used Kensington to partner with a significant church down in Brazil to make an impact in that country. God is working with the Timothy uh, Timothy Initiative to plant churches all around the globe. God has used Kensington for hurricane relief in, in Haiti and dealing with Mission of Hope. God has used Kensington for hurricane relief even after Katrina. God has used Kensington to help dig wells in Kenya for the Hope Water Project. God has used Kensington to work with schools and children in Pontiac to change the direction of their life. And God has helped even in the city of Detroit in the Brightmore district with, with City Mission. Although City Mission no longer exists, the impact of City Mission still reverberates in Detroit. And we could go on and on and on and on. But I think sometimes we need to just stop and pause and reflect and give praise to the Lord for what he has already done. I'll pay you later. You know, I was, I was, because <laughs> I was thinking I was about to ask you guys to give the Lord a hand clap of praise. That's what we do in our church. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? And before I had a chance, she already said, praise the Lord. You know what I mean? But, but I do want to invite, can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise like we really mean it? Like God has really done something. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. God is doing great things, and so Moses has the opportunity to recount what the Lord has done. Before I go to the next point, I just want to remind us that a lot of the ways that we are able to do that is because you are generous. That that, that God puts it on your heart first to give to the ministry, and that the ministry has the opportunity to turn around and to bless others. So I just want to remind you that when you leave today, there are places in the back where you can give. Those of you who are online can give in multiple different ways. But one of the reasons that we can bless others is because you give generously to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in your life. Well, Moses recounts what God has done, and Jethro hears, and Jethro praises the Lord, and Jethro now realizes that Jesus, not Jesus Christ, but the Lord is the Lord of all lords. Then in verse 13, it says, The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning to evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will whenever they have a dispute. It is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. 
Moses' father-in-law replied, what, what, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Moses had, had sent his family away because he had ministry to do. And he's doing a good work. And up until this time, God has used Moses to lead the people single-handedly. And, and now they had come out of Egypt. They were in the wilderness, and God had been leading that way up until that time. So why would God change? And if I need to do ministry, then maybe I just need to send my family away so that I might be able to focus more on the ministry that God has given me to do. But Jethro looks and he says, wait, 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 something's wrong with this picture, Moses. Something is wrong that all these people are waiting for you to make a decision with regard to their issue, and it's not going to work out for you or for them. Jethro comes in with fresh eyes, fresh eyes. He sees something that is obvious that, <laughs> that Moses doesn't see, and even the people who are around him don't necessarily see. I had a buddy of mine from Chicago come, and this is when I was single. He came and spent a couple nights with me. We used to work together in the automotive industry. He took a job in Chicago, and so he had to come back over, and so I, he stayed with me. And I got up that morning, went to work, and he kind of hung around my apartment. When I got home, he says, yeah, man, I was going through your refrigerator. And I realized that you had some lemonade. And so he says, so I just helped myself to some of the lemonade. But he says, but I realized when I opened the bottle, it wasn't lemonade, that it was like six-month-old milk that you had left in the back of your refrigerator. And I said, man, I had milk back then. <laughs> I opened that door every day, and I never saw that milk. You know, we become familiar with what we see so that we no longer see it. And it, sometimes it takes fresh eyes to come and see something that should be obvious to us, but we miss it. God had been dealing with Moses as he was leading the people in a certain way for so long, and so now Moses thought that this was the only way to do it, but there was another way. I'm going to tell my age, I'm about to tell my age right now by a series of pictures. Series of pictures. So I don't know if any of you remember this, but I used to, let's see if we can get the picture up there. I used to, I grew up on this. They were 45s, they were 33s, and they even had 78s. And that was how many revolutions it makes in a minute. And it would, it would play music. You would put a, a needle on there. This is for the young folk. You put a needle on there, and it would actually play music magically out of the speakers. And some of my parents' friends, they were high-tech. They had this thing called a reel-to-reel, -reel, and you would go over to their house, man, and they had it, and they were playing music. We just flow all through, and I thought, Ma, wow, this is, this is the life, man. Nothing gets better than that right there. Until my dad got a 76 Granada, Ford Granada, and in it he had this thing, had eight-track tapes. 
I don't know if y'all remember that, man, you hit the 8-track tape, you can listen to any song you want. That was cool, man. You was coming down the street, roll down the window, you could play your music. That was, that was cool. And I thought nothing got better than that. I thought nothing got better than that. <laughs> Until I was a teenager and they came out with the boom box. I had me one of those, man. You know what I mean? I had me one of those. I was, you know, I was cool. I was cool. Everybody, the whole purpose was so that the neighborhood could hear my music. You know what I mean? It didn't matter that I was going deaf, as long as everybody else could hear my music. But then we moved a little bit. It wasn't about, it wasn't about everybody hearing your music. Then it went to my own personal music. We had, the, you know, the Sony Walkman. And so you was cool. Now you got the Walkman and the whole thing. And you wanted everybody know you had a Sony Walkman. But then... Sony Walkmans, they kind of went out of date, and then they went to Sony Discman. You got to have a Discman, so you was, you was cool. Now, you, you, you was high tech when you got a, a Discman, and then they replaced the Discman with what? MP3 player. Nah, man, you don't even have to carry anything. It's all, it's all in there, and now everything is on the cloud. On the cloud. Now, what is the purpose of my illustration? I'm kind of wondering that right now, too. But you know, I, <laughs> But is that it is really all about being a carrier and a provider of music. Different ways to do it. Whether it's vinyl or reel-to-reel or it's eight track or whether it's cassette or whether it's CD, whatever it is, the whole purpose is to transport music to your ears. And ministry is the same way. God is concerned about ministry being done for his glory. There might be different methods. There might be different avenues at different times, at different stages. But the point is, are we doing ministry to the glory of God? Moses was doing ministry one way, and God had used that to get them out of Egypt and now on the way to the promised land. But now it's time to use a different format because you are in a different stage of growth. Verse 19 Jethro tells Moses, he says, Listen now, listen. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave, but select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate this honest game and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. Moses, find capable people. Find individuals who are trustworthy that you can trust to do this and organize it so that you only have to deal with the tough cases. You know, I love this. It's, 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 it's a few principles here. Uh, number one, you don't just choose anybody to help with the ministry. You don't, have, you, don't just, you don't just choose anything. Number one, you find people who have the ability, individuals who are capable. You need to find that. They, they, they need to have the ability. It's not just nice people. It's, it's, it's individuals who have the ability to do the ministry. 
Second thing, make sure you find somebody who is trustworthy. Make sure you find somebody that when you're not around, you can trust them wholeheartedly with the task. And then third, which I think is implied in this, is that they have to be individuals who are willing to do the job. And you can find people who have the ability, and you might even find individuals you can trust, but do they want to do the ministry? Do they want to do the work? Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, a little pastoral secret. We all know that there's three ty types of people at our churches, three types of people. Okay, I'm, I'm, you, you, you can write this down. You can go, 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 go to another church, ask any pastor, he'll tell you the same thing. I'm, 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 about, I'm about to disclose the beans right here. <laughs> we got very reliable people, and we love them. Very reliable people. You know, Pastor, what, 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 what you need, what you need, what you need? Hey, when do you need it? Oh, man, yeah, 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 hey, hey, hey. Can, you know, we ask them, can you do this or whatever? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. When, when do you want it done? How do you want to do it? You know, they come back, they blow our minds the way they do stuff. Oh, man, very reliable people. Man, we love them, we love them, we love them. May their tribe increase. <laughs> then we got very nice people. Very nice people. Pastor, oh, we, we just love you, Pastor. Pastor, Pastor oh, Pastor, we just love, we just love, we, we, we love you, oh, we love, we love you, we love your family, we love everything. But you ask them to do something, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, not, not doing nothing. You know what I mean? But I love you, I love you, very nice, very nice, very nice people. And then we got very draining people. They come with this giant sucking sound. <laughs> Drain everything out of you. <laughs> very reliable, very nice, very draining. My prayer for all of God's people, that we would be very reliable people. That, 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 that we have the ability in different areas because God has created us all different. We, we, we have abilities. That we have character. But we are willing to do what God is prompting us to do. And he says here in verse 23, Jethro to Moses, if you do this, and God so commands, I love that phrase, you will be able to stand the strain, and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. God has chosen each of us for a task. Each of us has the ability. We might have abilities in different areas, but we all have the ability to accomplish the task that God has given to us. All of us are a work in progress. Our character is not fully formed, but because the Holy Spirit is living within us, the Holy Spirit is transforming us into what he wants us to be. So we are all being formed with a proper character. The question is, <laughs> are we all willing 
Are we all willing to do the task? Now, this is interesting because in Moses' day, Jethro is saying, Moses, you need to go out and you need to choose people. You need to figure out who they are. You need to figure out who has the ability, who has the right character, and who is willing to do it. Moses, that's your responsibility. But in our day, it is the Holy Spirit who is prompting us. It is the Holy Spirit that is picking us. And we either say yes or no to his prompting. The Holy Spirit is the one. It's not the pastor. It's, it's not the leaders. It's not, it's not somebody on stage who says, you, you are the one that I need to do this. No, it is the Holy Spirit prompting you in your heart. And so often we say, no, no, no. Some of you probably know Jill Marshall. She attends Kensington, and she was one of my students actually out at the seminary. And she ended up doing mission work down in South Africa with, I believe it is Africa Ignite. I think that was the name of the ministry our church used to give and support her. And so when she was home one time, I asked her if she would come and speak to our church to kind of share the vision of what God is doing in uh, Africa, Ignite, Ignite Africa, and her ministry. And so, you know, you know, pa I'm pastor, professor, whole thing. Yeah, Jill, come on and share. And so she's, she's sharing about what the Lord is doing. And, 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 and while she's sharing, I'm, of course, I'm thinking, okay, this is for, this is for them. This is for um, the, my congregation. The Lord starts speaking to me. <laughs> you know, that ain't supposed to happen. You know what I mean, I got, I, got, I got a plan. You know, Lord, you're messing up my plans right here. You know, I want, I want to see some of our people do, like, short-term missions and, and that type of stuff. And so then afterwards, I end up talking to, to Jill, and I says, well, you know, I just, this is kind of odd. I just, I just felt like when you were sharing and you were talking about opportunities to come down there and maybe teach and minister, I, I, you know, I just felt like maybe he was you know, talking to me. And Jill says, well, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe the Lord is. You should pray about it. You know, the only, only problem is that I had swore I'm never going to Africa. You know what I mean? So I was just like, okay, now I, I got a problem because I said I ain't nothing in Africa for me. I, you know, I, I, I just had no desire whatsoever to go to Africa. But now I got a problem because I feel like the Holy Spirit, after she didn't talk, is telling me that I need to go to Africa. And so, like most of us do, I ignore the voice. <laughs> that same week, one of my good friends who was a pastor called me up and says, hey, you want to do breakfast? I said, yeah, we do breakfast. And so we're doing breakfast, and he's talking about a whole a lot of things. And then right before we get ready to leave, he says, hey, uh, I was just wondering. I'm going to Uganda, and I'm just wondering, would you like to go to Uganda with me? And I'm saying, oh, my God. <laughs> this has got to be the Lord. You know, I said yes maybe some 12, 13 years ago. I can't remember. And I have never regretted it. We have planted churches in Uganda. We have done great work in Uganda. We have encouraged pastors in Uganda. We've done training centers in Uganda. We've helped build up a Bible college in Uganda. All because somebody who did not want to go responded and said yes not to Jill Marshall but to the prompting 
of the Holy Spirit. I believe in a congregation this size that the Holy Spirit is speaking to some of you to take that step with regard to ministry, take that step with regards to small group, take the next step because God is looking for those who are capable, those who are trustworthy, but also to those who He is calling. And He is calling some of you. Father God, we thank you for the reminder that you just didn't take Moses out of Egypt and the Israelites out of Egypt. But you are taking us out of our Egypts towards the promised land. But we, we have to say yes to your prompting. Bless us, empower us to say yay and amen. Amen. You guys can stand up with us for this last song. And I thought, what a, what a perfect song to end today with. Uh, as this is kind of just an anthem of us coming together and singing about God's grace and his mercy and just showing it to the world. So as we just sing this, uh, if your heart could just receive it, um, just join us in this song.
His kingdom come. Amen. Can you give him some praise this morning for that? Woo, come on. Let's go. You know, one, one thing I want to say is I love what Eric led us through this morning. Wasn't it incredible? Just the vision. And this is my encouragement to each and every one of us. What is, what is God saying to you today? What is that next step for you? One of the things that I'm always reminded of, uh, an author, Brendan Manning, said, we are all just beggars telling other beggars where to find bread telling each other where we experience the grace and the hope and the love of God because we all have been in seasons without and maybe we're on that journey right now we're like is this who he is is this what he offers so when we invite you to take a next step to go jump into a group to serve in a different capacity we're inviting you to be a part of that ongoing story just like for some of you somebody taught you where bread was where hope was where grace was you get to in turn do that for others and that is the story of the church steve andrews always says the church is one of the only organizations in the entire world that exist for the people who aren't there yet so reminder, it's his existence is to love those who haven't even walked in the doors and that we get to do that together. So out in the lobby, there are opportunities. There's small groups that you could jump into. You can get some information on. There's a place to connect with people. If you're like, I, I feel like I got to be a part of a serving team. There's our hub and our team would love to walk with you and help you do that. So grateful for you being here. Can we give one last thank you to Dr. Moore? And uh, we will see you next week for the kickoff of our new series. God bless you. Have a great week.